Fine. In uh, 1972, I uh, worked for a magazine called Life. It was the last sort of mass circulation common denominator magazine. And there was a sense that it would not last forever. Look, the Saturday Evening Post and Colliers had all already sunk. And there was a sense that the time was running out on life. And I wrote entertainment for that magazine. And I think I was in California putting together a piece on Peter Falk, Colombo. And uh, <laughs> this bank robbery had already occurred. And they called me back. I think it was a belated and desperate effort to become hip. And at the last moment, to find a new audience. Uh, and another reporter, Tom Moore, and I worked on the story. And we uh, sort of divided it up. Uh, I interviewed, and some things we did together, I talked to the FBI guy, I uh, talked to uh, most of the hostages and to the bank manager, and uh, we shared an interview with uh, Liz Eden, aka Ernest Aaron, <laughs> Chris Sarandon, and so forth, and uh, put the story uh, together. And it was instantly killed by the editors. <laughs> uh, it didn't, wasn't turned to run. And then some people at the magazine who liked it sort of ganged up on the editor who said no. And, uh, and it ran. And in this article, Boys in the Bank, I referred to uh, the bank robber, uh, John Wojciewicz, as having the broken face who looks at an Al Pacino. <laughs> now, I'm not. Smart. I'm not that kind of smart. <laughs> <laughs> but I plant the cue for movie interest, but by golly, Al, a guy named Marty, right? A Marty Elfman, who was part of a guy named Marty. Right? All these Hollywood people seem to be Martys. Uh, <laughs> read the article on the plane, and uh, he, like most most agents, did want to be a producer himself, and that's the way uh, it turned out. Uh, the movie prospered. Uh, in a small way, I prospered. Uh, initially, the screenplay by Frank Pearson was uh, nominated for best uh, best screenplay based on other uh, an adaptation based on other material, i.e., this article is in three thousand words. And I've always heard, don't know if it's true, can't personally confirm it, that that year he would have been up against Bo Goldman's adaptation of Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and so it became best original screenplay, which causes me no lost, lasting pain, but it's <laughs> my definition of original. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I think the movie's been great. It keeps, it keeps happening. It keeps coming. And I've often asked myself why. Because it was a story that wrote itself. It had lots of revelations, surprises, and turns on it. And it was built, you know, it's a one set kind of play, basically. But once you got past the sizzle, where was the stake? What was the underlying meaning of it? And I think it was the discovery, albeit temporary, of uh, that, that distances sometimes become connections. That sometimes just temporary and ephemeral connections, but connections not nonetheless. And yeah, you can say it was an early version of the Stockholm Syndrome, this diktat between uh, hostages and uh, their captors. And yet there was something there, and it lasted for a little while. I re it didn't last forever. You know, I think there was something that was generated in that bank that was profound. It did not last, you know. When I, by the time I interviewed the hostages, uh, that already fit, had faded, and they realized the underlying truth that someone had come into their lives with a gun. And that sense, belated sense of violation was in them. I remember the producer, Marty Elfan, talked to the bank manager, who was a guy named Barrett, I think, in real life. And he said, you know, we can, we can do something for, we can do something uh, for, uh, for John Boschewitz. We can do something for we get treatment. And the bank manager was not interested anymore in the well-being of John Boschewitz, you know. It was something else entirely. So it evaporated, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And I think you very nicely, all of you, captured that moment.